Malachi chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 9. A prophecy, the words of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I've hated, and I've turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due to me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due to me? says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations. From where the sun rises to where it sets, in every place incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying, oh, the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, oh, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. And now, you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen and if you do not resolve to honour my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've already cursed them because you've not resolved to honour me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you'll be carried off with it. And you will know that I've sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. The lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he's the messenger of the Lord Almighty and people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned from the way and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty, so I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you've not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everyone. Please keep open um, Malachi chapter one. We'll be spending some time in it. Let me add my welcome to Alistair's, particularly if you're new. My name's Robbie. I'm one of the staff members here. It's great to have you with us this morning. 
I wonder, as we begin this new series in the book of Malachi, I wonder whether church ever feels like a bit of a burden. See that bit in verse 13 of chapter 1? What a burden, the Israelites say, as they bring their sacrifices to the temple. Does church ever feel like that to you? Or maybe you kind of volunteer or you give quite a bit of your time or your money to church, I'm not sure, but it just feels like a drag. It's hard work to give up all of Saturday to do the children and youth worker training or iHub leaders training or whatever it is. Maybe the burden comes because you've just lost that joy of the Christian walk. I imagine in a room like this, there's a number of different experiences of that sort of feeling. For some, it's just that sense that life isn't like what it used to be when we were university students. Then it was so fun to be a Christian. Everyone was going for it in the Christian Union. And now it's just a bit humdrum going through the motions. Once a week, we come. Maybe there's some who even now still feel like they're only just coming out of the post-COVID pandemic blues. Lots of us kind of were knocked in our routines and habits when it came to our spiritual life Uh, and I worship together as a church. We've lost the joy a little bit, and we lost our routines. I think this kind of feeling is especially hard and prevalent when life just throws you a curveball, something really hard. I'm sure that there is a lot of suffering represented by the faces that are looking at me this morning in this room, and I don't know all your different struggles and suffering, but it can take a knock, can't it? Or maybe it's just that life doesn't feel quite as exciting as you imagined it would be at this stage. Ugh, another summer over, another term of school. It's the kids and the parents and the teachers who feel that, by the way. Another year of widowhood or singleness or childlessness. Here we go again. When life's hard, it can be easy to turn cold towards God, can't it? And maybe you're visiting us and you're not a Christian and you just... You perhaps never experienced this, but you're very, very welcome if that's you. I hope that as you listen in, um, you'll get something from this passage. We're beginning a new series in the book of Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament, and it's the latest book, if you like, in the Old Testament too. It's written a hundred or so years after God's people who've come back into the promised land after spending time in exile in Babylon. You remember Daniel in the lion's den and Queen Esther and all that? That was in Babylon. God's people have come back and it's not that exciting. They had some high hopes. The new Jerusalem, the rebuilt temple was supposed to be the fulfillment of all of the prophetic hopes of the Old Testament. But for the Israelites who come home, their expectations are dashed. And after a kind of okay start, they prove to be just as corrupt and sinful as that generation that was sent to exile in the first place. There's a bit of a difference. Before the exile, the huge sin was wandering away from God. It was, it was idolatry and, and, and complete rejection of his ways. Once they've come back, it's a little bit more subtle, a kind of slow burn apathy, cynicism, half-heartedness, just going through the motions, a kind of external religion, but bored of God. But deep down... The heart issue is the same. And actually, as we'll see, it has the same kinds of awful consequences too. I'm struck by this. Many of us are familiar with that little, um, that little tract or kind of booklet that we sometimes give to people inquiring about Christianity called Two Ways to Live. And it really helpfully outlines how um, there's basically, really, when you look at the Bible, only two ways to live. With God as our, as our ruler and Lord or without him. The pastor, Tim Keller, has a very provocative and helpful little sermon called Three Ways to Live. He agrees with that paradigm, but says, look, actually, when you think about it, there really are two ways that you can reject God. The complete throwing away of everything, the running away, the, older, the, the younger brother running to the, um, the, kind of spend all his money um, and, and ending up with the pigs. Or the older brother, the self-righteous, externally religious person but deep down, he's rejecting God. I wonder if you can relate to any of that. If you can, then my prayer is that over the next few weeks, as we study the book of Malachi together, it's a book that wakes us up out of our stupor, but also reminds us of the goodness and love of God. Because actually, ultimately, that's the solution that the prophet Malachi lays before us. The solution to apathy, to half-heartedness, is to lift our eyes to see who God is and what he's like. We need to see the character 
of our God. And that, I guess, shapes the two headings that we'll look at this passage under this morning. God is our great lover. This is verses one through five. And he's our great Lord. Verses six through nine. Uh, uh, one, six to two, verse nine. Here's the first thing. God is our great lover. He is full of unconditional commitment to his people. Have a look at verse two. I have loved you, says the Lord. It's a beautiful phrase. A sense of not just having loved them in the past, but ongoing, still loving them now. And we must grasp the love of God. There's no direct applications or imperatives in this first little bit, in these first five verses, apart from this. Realize, if you are a believer, how much you are loved. It's going to underpin everything else that follows. There's stuff in the book of Malachi that is pretty challenging. As Nick prayed, it's it's kind of a rebuke to the people of God. In fact, chapter 1, verse 1, a prophecy can be more literally translated burden. What Malachi has to share from God sometimes feels pretty heavy. The book is structured as a series of kind of six arguments or disputes. God is taking his people to task on a variety of different topics. But it starts here, this first one, with the love of God. As one commentator puts it, Malachi is a love letter to a wandering people. And there's profound pastoral wisdom for us, I think, in beginning here. There may be all sorts of mess to unpick in our lives this morning. But if you're a follower of Jesus, begin with this. There's one thing to take out of Malachi chapter 1. It's this. I have loved you, says the Lord. He's our great lover. He abounds in steadfast, patient, and unconditional, and enduring love. In light of this reality, you really feel the shock of what the people say back, don't you? I've loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? This isn't the kind of longing or confusion of the hurting believer. Lord, I don't get it. I don't see your love. How long will I have to suffer? How have you loved me? That's the kind of prayer that you do get in the Bible. The Psalms are full of that kind of prayer. It's actually a prayer of deep trust and faith. All of us suffer. Now, what they're saying here is kind of like the grumbling, stroppy whinging of a teenager. And I'm sorry if you are a teenager. I'm not presuming you're like that. Yeah, right, God. You don't love me. That's the tone. And it's an insight, isn't it, into their spiritual state. To an extent, you can understand, yeah, life after exile wasn't flashy like before. And you can certainly relate. It's all very well saying, God loves me, but what if I don't actually feel it? Well, in all of the the kind of six arguments or disputes that there are in Malachi, there's the same pattern. God says something, the people kind of respond or they disagree with it or they question it, and then God responds again. And his response here is kind of a bit different from what you'd expect. How have you loved us? God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. It is a strange answer, actually, isn't it? You'd imagine, right, the question of how have you loved us, that God would list off all the great stuff that he has done for Israel over the years. Oh, I rescued you from Exodus. I was really patient with you in the judges' generation when you guys were just all over the place. I gave you kings, and I was patient with you then as well when the kings were awful. I brought you back from, from exile in Babylon. I've loved you so much. But instead, he tells this little story from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, Esau and Jacob. I think it's deliberate, though. It's a story that shows God's sovereign grace and undeserved mercy. Remember the twins, Jacob and Esau? Esau's the firstborn. Jacob, who actually inherits the promise is, um, and is renamed Israel, he's, he's the second one. And the story is a story of God's unconditional love for undeserving Jacob. The language of love and hate might feel a bit unfair. I think it's here to mark out the contrast. Jesus says, love your parents, but then anybody who follows me will hate their mother and father. It's to mark out that contrast. In fact, God is very good to Esau in the Genesis story. But what is most remarkable about this story is that God would choose to love either of them. To be completely fair, they're both pretty bad pieces of work. 
The name Jacob actually means deceiver. And his life, as you read through Genesis, is marked out by double dealing and cheating and trickery and and a kind of horrible favoritism to his children. He's an absolute scoundrel. But God patiently works with him in spite of all his mess. The Apostle Paul, when he reflects on this passage in Malachi, highlights God's undeserved sovereign grace and mercy. He says, Romans chapter 9, verse 11, before the twins were born or had done anything, good or bad, in order that God's purpose at election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. The whole point of the Jacob story is that he does not deserve God's favor. God's love for us is unconditional and undeserved. It's so easy for us to forget that, isn't it? But that is not all. He's also a great lover because the Jacob and Esau story shows us his steadfast commitment to his people. End of verse three again. I've turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the jackals. They may say we'll rebuild the ruins, but this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I'll demolish. There'll be a people always under the wrath of God. Now, to get this little bit, you need a bit of kind of ancient Near Eastern geopolitics. So hang on if this, if this isn't really your thing. But Esau's descendants, okay, become the people group Edom, the Edomites. And throughout the Old Testament, they are a fierce enemy of God's people, Israel. You can read about them in, in the prophet Obadiah. As God's people were carted off into exile, the Edomites were kind of shouting from the sidelines, mocking, you guys are losers. But actually, God would have the last laugh. As Israel returns, they're kind of slowly rebuilding the ruins. At the same time, Edom was coming undone. They were also impacted by the Babylonian invasion, but then their kind of towns and villages were picked off by some nomadic warrior tribes. By the time of Malachi, the proud nation that had taunted Israel a few hundred years before has been defeated. It's gone for good. And I think there's a lesson here for us. It's especially tempting to doubt God's love when things look really, really hard. But the lives of Esau and Jacob, the kind of histories of Edom and Israel, highlight the big difference between those who are God's people and those who are not God's people. The difference is not that one deserves God's love and the other doesn't. Neither deserve God's love. Both sin and turn away from him. Both actually suffer the consequences too. The difference is God's, uh, God himself, he alone, and his love for them. God loves his people. Eden will not be rebuilt. But Jerusalem, even as Malachi speaks, is in the process of restoration. Can I just say, if you are here this morning and you're not a believer, you wouldn't call Jesus your saviour and Lord, then this invitation is open to you. We talk about God's love, and and in a generic sense, God loves the world. He sent his one and only son. But those who trust in Jesus Christ have the absolute privilege of knowing his unconditional, never let you go, steadfast and enduring love. If you don't trust Jesus, then that's not something that you can enjoy, but it is on offer. Hear the invitation. As we go on through Malachi, this, this love issue is central. Please keep on to it. If you don't know about the love of the Lord, then you'll never fix a cold and apathetic heart. It's the problem, I think, behind all the other problems that will come. Malachi will talk about family life and injustice and wealth and religion. We'll see that in just a sec. But you need to hold on to this fact that God is a great lover. Without it, everything else falls apart. That was one through five. He's a great lover. Here's the second thing. God is a great Lord. This is chapter 1, verse 6 through 2, verse 9. He's a great Lord, and he demands our wholehearted worship. Verse 6. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where's the honor due to me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due to my name, says the Lord Almighty? You priests show contempt for my name, but you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? Well, by offering defiled food on the altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? That same kind of pattern again. We get this, don't we? The, the illustration of a father 
or a master. It's a relationship that demands respect. He's our Lord. But that same back chat from the people of God. Their hearts are shown in their corrupt worship. Verse 8 through 14 describe a group of believers just phoning in their religion, giving God the leftovers, the lowest possible percentage of self-denial and effort, how little we can do to get into heaven. That's what they're thinking. Verse 8, Will you offer, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering that to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. The book of Leviticus specifies that only spotless animals should be brought to the temple for sacrifice. But the Israelites are taking that, they're mocking that idea. And you can imagine it, you're having a kind of a dinner for your neighbors, you invite some of them around or something like that, some non-Christian neighbors on your street, you want to get to know a bit better. And you say, guys, we're going to have a roast dinner, but um, thank goodness for you, what I've done, I've kept those bits that I normally scrape off the plate into the bin after left yesterday's um, kind of lunch, and uh, I kept them in a little Tupperware, and that's your bit. You'd never do that, would you? Or, or think of a big project at work. Your boss says to you, oh, I'm taking you off everything for the next month. I, I just want you to focus on this. It's actually a big shot. I, I want to really stretch you. It's going to be a great opportunity, and you know, there's potentially a promotion at the end of this. I expect you to work really hard. And you give it 10 minutes, send off a quick email, that's it, that's all I'm going to do. I mean, can you imagine? You wouldn't dare try that at work or with your neighbors. God says, well, why do you think it's okay with me? Verse 10 is pretty shocking. If you can't be bothered to serve God with your whole life, then don't bother at all. Oh, verse 10, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased. I will accept no offering for your hands. This is God saying, just, just go away. Just stop. If this is your attitude, then why are you here? It's better that you didn't come. You do realize, he says, I am the God of the universe. This sacrifice stuff, it's not for my sake. It's not as if I need your animals. It's for yours. Verse 11, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations. It's a future promise of all the peoples who will one day turn and worship God. He doesn't need us, our worship. Their attitude, verse 12 and 13, is, is almost laughable were it not so serious. You say, what a burden, verse 13, and you sniff at it contemptuously. Sniff at, it's like literally sighing. <sighs> Can you just do my sacrifice first? Because this is such a faff and I've got better things to do with my time. It's the clock watching, the tapping of the feet, the distracted scrolling. I really hope this sermon's done by 11.05 because dinner's waiting in the oven. And it's no good saying, oh, well, you'll change. I'll change if you're not actually going to follow through with it. I think that's what's going on in verse 13 and 14. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and, um, and vows to give it but then sacrifices a blemished animal instead. For I'm a great king, says the Lord Almighty. My name's to be feared. It's not about how much they're giving. One older commentator I was reading said this, God doesn't despise the widow's might. Remember that poor woman who gave what she could. But he will despise the miser's might, especially when the blinded man is dreaming that by this beggarly shift, he's securing the favor of God. That's their corrupt worship. He moves on to 139. It's part of this, first, this, this second dispute. That's why we've put it together. He moves on from their corrupted worship to their corrupted leaders. And now the priests, this warning is for you. Now the priests are clearly very complicit in the shoddy sacrifices and stuff that's happening, but they're also failing in one of their other key primary responsibilities. Just glance at verse 7. The lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty and people seek instruction from his mouth. Priests in the Old Testament kind of have a representative role. They kind of stand between God and the people. Part of their role is sacrifices, but part of their role also 
is to teach the people the law. And also, did you notice it in verse 6? To demonstrate it in their own lives. That's what's going on, I think, there. True instruction was found in, he's talking about Levi, one of the key priests in the Old Testament. True instruction was found in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and in uprightness and turned many away from sin. Healthy doctrine, healthy lifestyle. But in Malachi's day, it's the exact opposite. Verse 8. You've turned from the way, and by your teaching, you've caused many to stumble. You've violated the covenant with Levi, and so God will punish. I've caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you've not followed my ways, and I've shown partiality in matters of the law. God promises to give these corrupt and unjust leaders just what they deserve. The language of cursing, actually, is pretty striking. I skipped over verse Two and three, you can ask about it or read about it later. There's that stuff about dung, which is kind of offensive. But I think the point is that the, the, the dung of the festival sacrifices that was meant to be thrown away, God's going to smear on their faces as a kind of way of saying, look, I'm going to make it really visible and obvious how shameful you are and how much you've offended me. Note, though, because it's quite a heavy section. Just note verse two. God says... Oh, yeah, verse one, sorry. And now you priests, this warning is for you. And verse four as well, this warning. God has not completely done with his people. Even in this little section, which feels pretty heavy, there is the grace and patience and forbearance of God. The whole reason he's telling them this is because he wants them to come back to him. You may be asking that. I mean, how on earth does all this stuff apply to us? Is this a big telling off for the church? Is this what we're doing wrong? We don't do sacrifices. We don't have priests in the same way that they did. And that's true. In the New Testament, sacrifice and priesthood, those big Old Testament ways of relating to God, are fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. He was a perfect, spotless lamb who died for us. He is the great high priest who intercedes for us, and from his lips come instruction. By his spirit, his law is imprinted onto our hearts. That's our privilege if we're New Testament believers. But I think there are some kind of tracks to chase through as we come to our lives too. In our worship of the Lord, both gathered and scattered in all of our lives as we serve him, the New Testament describes that as a sacrifice. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you can look it up later, or Hebrews 13, Let me read out Hebrews 13, verse 15. Through Jesus, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices is God pleased. God does not need the things that Christians offer him, whether it's songs sung together in the church building or or money given or, or volunteering or whatever. He doesn't need it. But he is delighted when in joyful response to the way that God has sacrificed so much for us, in the way that Jesus has died for us, Christians gladly take up their cross and follow him. And I don't don't know about you, but as I think about this kind of half-heartedness of the people of God, there are some things that challenge me. Here's a few questions perhaps to reflect on in the week. When it comes to our lives, do we give the best or the leftovers? Verse 8, the kind of lame animals from the flock. Question 2, is sacrifice and service a pleasure for us? Or do we sometimes resent it? Ugh, what a burden. Verse 13. Well, here's another question. Do we actually give? It's all very well saying that we'll live for him and singing that we'll live for him on a Sunday. Or is it all just words? Verse 14. The cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then gives a blemished animal. I think actually at the beginning of a new academic year, there's a good opportunity for us to, to rethink some of our priorities What about our attitude to meeting with the Lord's people together on a Sunday or in the middle of the week? What about our time? What about our money? I'll leave you guys to think about them on your own. There's also, I think, a particular application here for for leaders. Now, it's true that all people are priests in the New Testament. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, talks about the priesthood of all of us. We don't need anybody in order to come to God. We can just get down on our knees and pray to him, or as we're walking, say, Father, we don't need some mediator between us and him, because Jesus Christ is our great high priest. But I wonder if there are some lines of continuity between what's described here in terms of the responsibilities of the priests and those who have some kind of leadership or teaching responsibility in the church. Actually, the New Testament picks up those two things, doesn't it? The life and the doctrine of Christian leaders. So at the beginning, again, of a new academic year, there's there's a solemn warning here for us, for those involved in Bible study leading or, or teaching, whether it's in a home group or just in the home. Do you realize that? That as parents, we have some responsibility to instruct our children. I wonder what it means for us. Well, if you're feeling flat or weary or apathetic in the Christian life, I hope you've been challenged but also encouraged by Malachi chapter 1. Remember, the great antidote is to see the goodness and greatness of our God. I, I hope and pray that you don't go away from this thinking, oh, I must do better. That is not the answer. The answer is to see that God is our great lover and our great Lord. And I think there's something really instructive for us in the fact that Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. You imagine the people have come back from exile and nothing has changed. It looks forward and longs for a day, a time, when Jesus Christ will appear. He's not only our lover and our Lord, but also our perfect sacrifice, our perfect priest, a wholehearted worshipper who succeeds even when we fail. How could we not offer our bodies as living sacrifices for him? Let me close in a prayer. Our loving Lord, Malachi chapter 1 and 2 comes as a bit of a challenge to many of us, I think. I certainly feel that. But help us to fix our eyes on your character and goodness. You are the great Lord who delights in showing love and mercy, who demands wholehearted worship and obedience because of what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. Our Father, we long to be a church of people who give everything to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.